Hello, <laughs> my name is Yuna Kim and I'm currently 27 years old. Um, I used to be a K-pop star in South Korea and now I'm living with an extraordinary purpose. someone was pursuing the entertainment industry and they asked me for advice, I would say, don't do it! <laughs> Never! <laughs> you don't know what you're getting yourself into! <laughs> that really is what, what, what I would want to say. At the same time, I know it's not my right to judge what their talents are. Um, and if they have a talent and they have a God-given calling to be in that industry to minister to others, then um, that's something that I wouldn't want to discourage them from. I grew up in a very typical Korean household where parents' expectations are either be a doctor or a lawyer or a pharmacist. <laughs> and it was a very strict childhood. There was actually a lot of verbal and mental abuse, even some physical abuse as well. When I was in high school, there was a Korean audition program that was like a, similar to American Idol. And so it was happening in New York where I was living. So I went to go audition for fun in secret with my friends. That show was very popular in South Korea at that time. And my audition went viral. One of the top agencies in South Korea, home to Blackpink currently, they scouted me to be a trainee, to be a K-pop singer. And so as soon as I graduated high school, I left home, I left everything to pursue my new dreams of being a K-pop singer. I debuted as a solo singer. I released a song called Without You Now with one of the most famous rappers in Korea, Tasha, Yumi Rae, Tiger JK, Busy, featuring them. And then I debuted in a girl group called The Ark in 2015. And that, that broke up, that fell apart really quickly. And then in 2018, I was part of a two-member group called Khan with one of the members from the five-member girl group. And that was the group where I performed the song I'm Your Girl and we promoted the same time as BTS. And in Korea, there's a lot of music shows and there's like rehearsals. We happened to go right in front of BTS. And so they had their like in-ear, like the listening device on and they were listening to our entire performance like through their earbud. I was like, all right, but then we, me and my member, Minju, at that time we were promoting with a song that we just came out with and we're like, all right, let's do this because we prided ourselves in our live performance when a lot of the singers then did lip syncing. And so I was like, okay, let's do this. And we performed and when we came down, J-Hope, you know, one of the members, he was like, man, you guys are really good live. When I first decided to leave everything and go to South Korea to pursue these amazing, not normal dreams, I was like, yes! <laughs> I was like, freedom! I was like, no more, no more family, no more, no more being restricted, none of that prison environment. But now, now I finally have the choices to do what I want to do and figure out my life. And I was like, I'm gonna make the most out of this freedom. I'm gonna literally do everything I was always told not to do. So I went to Korea and naturally I made a lot of unwise decisions. I was drinking, partying, getting into a lot of toxic relationships. I just did a lot of things I really regret to this day. I pushed myself farther and farther away from God to the point where I think I almost lived like I was an atheist. Being in the K-pop industry was always very tough because just because you get asked to be a trainee and start training to be a K-pop singer doesn't mean you debut right away. The chances of you debuting are like a speck of sand on a beach. You're competing with so many other girls who are prettier than you, who have, who have way bigger talents than you, who have more experience than you, who have more money than you, who have more connections than you, and you're literally just struggling all by yourself to survive. Um, and naturally, because there's so much fierce competition, the environment itself is very extreme. Um, you, you don't really have anyone you can depend on. All these girls are literally like cats toward each other. And it's just very scary. You get monthly evaluated. Um, and during these monthly evaluations are when all the company 
representatives come together and they judge you on a specific performance that you do. Literally, they are there to criticize you in every single possible way and bring you down. Um, and the motive of that is to make you want to improve yourself. Um, and I think that was the start of something very toxic. It was a traumatic experience that has affected me continually to this day. Um, when I want to motivate myself to achieve something or do something, I can never do it in a positive way and I always have to bring myself down. I always have to say, you know, is this all you can do? Like, why are you, why are you such trash? Like, why are you so stupid? Why is this, why are you, why are you worth nothing? And um, that's still something I'm struggling to fix. It's improved a lot since then, but I think particularly during those times, it was very, very bad. I think some people want to be famous or they want to be celebrities. They want to be well known because they want to feel love. They want to be loved by others. And it's cool, you know, once you are a singer, once you start to become more and more famous and popular, you start getting fans who send you letters and presents, they encourage you, they come to cheer you on, and that's beautiful, it's, it's a blessing. But at the same time, you forget that opinions change in a matter of a snap of a finger. And especially when you're a celebrity, by even a single piece of news media or article, people's opinions about you change from good to terrible in a matter of minutes. Um, and in that process, your self-worth just completely gets demolished as well too. I think being famous means your self-worth comes from what people say your self-worth is rather than something that's consistent or wholesome. And you become so affected by that that you start getting depressed and feeling unloved, feeling unworthy, feeling like you have no place in this world. And that's really what has led a lot of people that even I know to commit suicide. So I think that really just speaks for itself what fame does to a person. During that time, that seventh year, my family was going through a very rough time and they could no longer support me. And my company at the same time was telling me that I couldn't work any part-time jobs because I would make them look bad because I'm a celebrity and so they didn't even let me work any part-time jobs. And so now being unable to fend for myself, no help from home, it's like there was nothing I could do. So I ended up seeking out secret like nighttime jobs. I worked at like a bar. That experience also was very tra traumatizing for me because there's a lot of sexual harassment and there was even people who recognized who I was and said, hey, aren't you, you know, Yuna Kim from What and What? And I was like, oh no, you know, I laughed it off and said, you know, it's probably someone similar. And then, you know, my friends would text me like, hey, where are you? And I was like, oh, I'm just in the practice room. I'm practicing and I would make up this bunch of lies and my situation so no one would know what I was going through and I would just cry myself to sleep and that would repeat day by day. And so that's when I got really depressed and I was wondering, man, like, why am I going through this right now? All I wanted was to be happy. Um, and that's when I started experiencing like demon experiences. I saw like demons like in the room and like I had just, just horrible nightmares and dreams like sleep paralysis and just I would get like choked and like just all these different things. I thought a lot about suicide and near around that time was when my sister contacted me. My sister met God when she was in college and she was always praying for me when I left home. Um, during that time I think I was just very selfish. I didn't care about anyone except for myself. Um, I was just consumed with my own problems, trying to make it in the industry. And my sister was always reaching out, you know, she was always sending me Bible verses and asking me for prayer requests. And whenever I looked at her text messages, I was very annoyed. I was like, man, why is she always talking about God and talking to me about these things that I don't care about? Um, and so I really ignored her for a very, very long time. And that's when one day I heard from my mom who told me, hey, like, did you hear, you know, your sister is very sick right now. And apparently it was very, very serious. And you know, my sister never mentioned that to me. So I was kind of in shock and that kind of made me reflect on myself the past seven years. And I had to wonder, man, did I even ask my sister once in that past seven years? 
hey, how are you? How are you doing? And I realized I did it. That really um, just completely broke me down. And I think that's when I prayed for the first time in a very long time. It was mostly in anger because, you know, I didn't have the right emotions, but I was like, hey, God, you know, my sister is one of the most faithful, nicest people I know. And, you know, if you don't heal her, then, you know, I don't believe that you're real and you have to heal her. And I was just, I think I was begging, kind of tantruming. I don't exactly know what emotions I was having at that moment. But um, I think through that incident of realizing my sister's condition and everything that was going on with her, um, I decided to take up her offer, asking me to come visit her in the States. This was the experience that completely changed my life. I met God for the first time. Um, he became very personal to me. He spoke to me. I knew he was real. I couldn't deny it. There were so many miracles. And so that's when I got baptized and I decided to dedicate my life to him and leave everything behind. Now my self-worth comes from God. It's the value that he has placed on me and I'm always going to be loved in his eyes and that's unchanging and so I'm just very lucky to have a God who loves me no matter how lacking or how inefficient just yeah no matter how imperfect I can be he loves me the same as as a sinner um, and he's always extending his hand out to me and knowing that having that hope in my head has helped me to hold my head up and try to show that love back to the world and share his love to others. I've been married for about almost five months now. Um, that's been super exciting. And you know, I realized that you can't ever plan out your life. Like you think you know when you're ready for even things like marriage, but you don't. I was like, oh, you know, I was so passionate. I was like, okay, now I gotta go to third world countries and, and preach to the, to the people in need and just travel all over the world and do my thing and ah, <laughs> for God. And turns out God was like, you know, as much as you're on fire and, and you think you're set out for that stuff, I think in the long run, what you need is stability. You need a stable environment, something that you've never had growing up and I want you to minister by showing a Christ-like family, a Christ-like union. And that's when he really brought my husband to me. It's been completely amazing. Sometimes young people do not want to get married because they're afraid of settling down and they think it's like this whole scary experience. But I think truly finding someone who loves you in a Christ-like way is the most beautiful thing you can ever experience. Jesus has been my hero in everyday life because he always reminds me to have hope. He's never left and he's always been in that same spot still holding his hand out to me and telling me that it's okay. I think that's what my sister was doing. She was sharing the gospel to me, all her nudges and her prayer requests, that experience that summer that completely changed my life. That was because of the good news of Christ um, and the hope that God gives us. Without that, I don't even think I'd be alive here today. The gospel can really do so much more for all those young people out there who are always striving to run and chase after a dream or success or money or something that's really not going to give them that fullness um, in life. I think the gospel will give them hope to start striving for something that really um, will make them truly happy. For someone with so many struggles and possibly who has not had spiritual interest, Turning to God might be a struggle, it might be a challenge because you don't really believe He's there. If you are going through or you have gone through struggles that I have gone through, I would like to encourage you to um, try praying and asking God to work with you in your unbelief. Say, God, like I want to believe in you. I want to believe that you're there. I want to believe that you can help me. I want to believe that my life can be better than what it is right now. But I'm struggling and I don't believe it. So please help me to believe. God works with every degree of faith that you may have.